I am Leonard Patterson. When I was a young man, only 23 years old, I joined the Communist Party. I was a member of the National Executive Committee of the American Young Communist League. In 1930, I was the official Communist candidate for election to New York State Assembly. I knew Gus Hall and other top-ranking American Communists very well because I trained with them at the Lenin University in Moscow. I joined the party because I honestly thought the communists were trying to help American Negroes. I broke away from the party when it became clear to me what the communists were really up to, was to use the Negro people in this country as cannon fodder in a violent and bloody revolution aimed at the establishment of the American Soviet dictatorship. It was that simple, and it is still that simple today. Make no mistake about it. What is happening in the United States right now under the banner of civil rights is exactly what has happened in China, in Cuba, in Algeria, and many other places around the world. When I was studying communist tactics and strategy in Moscow, my instructors emphasized the importance of using honest grievances and popular slogans as a smokescreen to cover up the true nature of the revolution. We were taught how to use propaganda and arouse the emotion of the masses. We learned how to set one group against the other and to make them hate each other. We learned the necessity of having martyrs, and we were even told how to create our own martyrs if they did not imagine the result from the atmosphere of hatred. We were taught the importance of getting large masses of people into the street for marches and demonstrations. And finally, we were instructed in ways to take off riots and make them spread and to keep them going. When I returned to the United States, I was immediately given practical training. I participated in so-called nonviolent demonstrations that were deliberately calculated irritate white people into violence against us. I personally was in charge of organizing a march on Washington to dramatize the Scottsboro Boys case. In New York about 1935, a Negro boy was reported killed by the owner of a store while in the act of stealing some merchandise. Communist Party headquarters decided to make a march out of the boy. So we went right to work putting out handbills and holding open air meetings. In less than a half hour after we started, there was a race ride on 125th Street, complete with smashing wonders of white storekeepers, looting and all the rest. I'm not speaking of things I read about. These are things I personally participated in. I'm Julia Brown. For nine years, I was a member of the Communist Party, serving as an undercover agent for the FBI. During that time, I learned that the communist conspiracy had been planning and working for years to bring violent revolution to America. It was to be a communist revolution, but the great majority of the American people would not be allowed to realize that until it had already happened. If all goes according to the communist blueprint, Americans will believe that the chaos and violence has something to do with civil rights. Our enemies were quick to find our weakest point for their attack. They knew that racial differences could provide them with an excellent wedge to divide our people. Their strategy simply has been to keep hammering on that wedge, to drive it deeper into our social structure, to open all wounds that have long since healed, 
and deliberately to create new ones wherever they can. Now, this doesn't mean that there isn't a legitimate need for the advancement of civil rights for many of our Negro citizens. Of course, there is a need there. Otherwise, communist agitators posing as civil rights leaders could never hope to enlist massive support for their schemes. The aspirations of Negroes for full equality were not created by communists, but they are used by communists in such a way that idealistic Americans of all races can be tricked into implementing the communist blueprint for revolution. Having been on the inside of the Communist Party, it's easy for me to recognize this revolutionary agitation in disguise. But the average American finds it's hard to believe that something as worthy and noble sounding as a civil rights movement could possibly be a communist maneuver. Communism must be built with non-communist hands. The revolutionary accepts reform in order to use it as a cover for his illegal work. By concealing the true communist objectives behind appealing slogans and pretended humanitarian goals, the conspirators are able to dupe hundreds of uninformed opportunists and misguided idealists into supplying the non-communist hands needed in the overthrow of this republic. We can and must write in a language which sows among the masses hate, revulsion, and scorn toward those who disagree with us. Members and front organizations must continually embarrass, discredit, and degrade our critics. When obstructionists become too irritating, label them as fascist or Nazi or anti-Semitic. Constantly associate those who oppose us with those names which already have a bad smell. The association will, after enough repetition, become fact in the public mind. By duping the American public into turning a deaf ear to the voices of warning because the topics were controversial or because the patriots themselves had been ridiculed as extremists, racists, fright peddlers, the conspirators were ready to move one step closer to their hidden goals by precipitating mob violence. Riots, demonstrations, street battles, Detachments of a revolutionary army. Such are the stages in the development of the popular uprising. The Communist Party will educate and organize the working masses for mass strikes and mass demonstrations. It is through struggles that the working masses are prepared for the final conflict for power. As these strikes grow in number and intensity, they acquire political character through unavoidable collision and open combat with the capitalistic state. Mass action culminates in insurrection and civil war. 